Mr. President, Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. The United Nations should be made fully responsive to the challenges of our times. Pakistan will continue to participate actively in this process and endeavor with other member states to build a world where conflict is outlawed and equitable prosperity for all pursued in conditions of peace and security. Pakistan seems to be a pivotal state because it's been an ally of the United States historically. It's an ally of China, two countries with diametrically opposing political systems. What can Pakistan learn from both these systems and can it move forward with, with taking the best out of these two systems? How do you see both countries? The, um, first of all, every country must evolve according to its own conditions, its own traditions, its own experience whatever it's gained over a period of time, uh, you know, eliminate the, uh, uh, the mistakes, improve, learn, and of course, look around. But look, a system succeeds for two reasons. One, because there is meritocracy, so you bring the best talent up. And secondly, there is accountability of people who are in power. These are the two main ingredients that uh, make uh, a state successful, a society successful. Now, why did democracy uh, go ahead of kingship? Because in our, um, the Muslim world, according to the great Iqbal, the reason why we were beaten by the Western countries is because they moved towards democracy and we moved from very democratic ideals from the state of Medina and we moved towards absolute kingship. So kingship has two problems. Kingship, neither is there meritocracy. And number two, neither is the king held accountable. So these are the two reasons why they could not compete with democracies. Now what China has achieved is quite unique. Without having electoral politics, China has managed a system where the Communist Party gets the best talent and actually brings it to the top. And secondly, I mean, and I was reading that in the last five years, over 400 ministerial level people have been thrown into jails for corruption. I don't want to create the misimpression that China is hunky-dory on way to some kind of superpower. Though. The country faces enormous challenges. Social and economic problems that come with wrenching change like this are mind-boggling. Pollution is one, food safety, population issues. On the political front, the worst problem is corruption. Corruption is widespread and undermines the system and its moral legitimacy. But most analysts misdiagnose the disease. They say that corruption is a result of the one-party system, and therefore, in order to cure it, you have to do away with the entire system. But a more careful look would tell us otherwise. Transparency International ranks China between 70 and 80 in recent years among 170 countries and it's been moving up. India, the largest democracy in the world, 94 and dropping. For the 100 or so countries that are ranked below China, more than half of them are electoral democracies. So if election is the panacea for corruption, how come these countries can't fix it? So they have managed to, without electoral democracy, they've managed the two. Do you think that Pakistan can play a positive role in finding a middle path between China and the United States? I hadn't thought about that. Uh, I would, uh, uh, I, I would think it'd be worth exploring on Pakistan's part, uh, particularly if there's a, a route or a way that they see forward, and they've done something uh, like that in the past. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm one that, I just try to encourage anything that might move the ball forward in a positive direction, uh, and if there's a chance, uh, we should try it. Uh, and and see if that's something that can move move forward well. One of my children, we have five children, one of them's adopted from China. Uh, and I'm banned from traveling to China because I've been critical uh, <laughs> of the human rights record, particularly on religious freedom. But I love the Chinese people. I think they're amazing and they're talented. And, and uh, But you know, you've got this conflict of systems. The important thing is to ensure that you have good governance, 
that the country is that stable and peaceful, that the differences with us are differences which we should learn to tolerate. Of course, people are different. They have different interpretations of Islam. They have different religions even. But the differences should not matter if you respect each other. You respect each other and you look for a way of living together in peace. The idea of civic nationalism that you talk about, can that be expanded to a global citizen view? Well, civic nationalism, the idea is very simple. You know, whereas many national identities are linked precisely to identity, that's immutable. Things that you acquire by birth, your race, your religion, your ethnicity, your language. Those are the markers of classic nationalism, ethno-religious linguistic nationalism. Uh, civic nationalism is not based on identity, but is anchored in institutions and constitutions. Imranji. Imran sir, I've been a fan of yours ever since uh, those cricket days, uh, long, long time, and I uh, admire you a lot. And I realize what you're going through. And I was speaking to Salman, and I thought strategically the best strategy uh, right this moment, because you know this kind of conflict with uh, gundas and hooligans and, and gangsters taking over the world is going on everywhere. And not just in Pakistan, frankly speaking, in India as well, in Palestine and Gaza and Israel, you name it, Ukraine, it's all happening. And as you know, special interest groups and money drive everything. So we were thinking, and uh, these uh, don't uh, uh, don't feel that we are doing this out of any arrogance. Just in, in, in terms of humility and strategy, that the best thing for you right now, this is an opportunity to not only take uh, leadership uh, over again, hopefully, in Pakistan, but actually be perceived as a global leader. You speak, and have you spoken of the elite capture of resources in Pakistan? West toxification and Huni liberals. How do you explain that to a Pakistani teenager? Uh, West toxification means that people, uh, and sadly because of uh, colonialism, which destroys the self-esteem of a, of a, of a, of a people. Uh, what colonialism does is that it ingrains this inferiority complex. And because of this inferiority complex, people begin to believe that whatever comes from their ma uh, uh, ex-masters is progress. Some say I am So, so in the case of uh, the Western dominance of basically Muslim countries, uh, there is a belief that modernization is Westernization, which uh, Ali Shariati used to call Westoxification. And that is very damaging because you, it, it takes away the critical thinking of, of, of looking at the Western society and look at the pluses and the minuses. But when you bring a whole, accept a whole way of life without critically analyzing you, it can cause immense damage in your society, and it has. The second word about uh, Huni liberals, because you see, for me, liberals are humane. So when liberals, so-called liberals, are, are, are urging drone attacks, which are killing human beings in villages, women, children, and then they are all for drone attacks, 
It's a contradiction in terms. A liberal basically is humane. He's anti-war. All the liberal movements I know, uh, you know, from my university days and throughout, they were all anti-war. When we start, I remember in the 70s, it was the anti-Vietnam movement. They were all liberals who were anti the Vietnam War. How come that these so-called liberals are pro-war in, in, in Pakistan? That's why I call them Khuni liberals. Prime Minister, you've publicly said this at so many fora, that the greatest asset, one of the greatest asset Pakistan has is overseas Pakistanis. Who, whose remittances are over $20 billion each year and they have increased. But they don't have the right to vote. They can't, there is resistance within Pakistan if an overseas Pakistani comes and tries to help the uh, government, uh, you know, there is a lot of resistance. What can your government uh, do with parliament to pass legislation that they'll be able to vote in future elections and they will be able to serve Pakistan without this mafia trying to kick them out? Look, uh, number one, we are in the process of making electoral reforms so that the overseas Pakistanis can participate. Number two, uh, of uh, dual citizens being able to stand for elections, I think they should. It's only if they get a, a ministerial position that they have to give up uh, their nationality. Uh, the resistance to overseas Pakistanis to work in positions we have actually uh, in the Supreme Court, we have fought the case and we have now overseas uh, dual nationals can actually be in any position of expertise. So we have actually fought against this status quo and actually uh, 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 reinstated them. Actually not reinstated, before that there was a lot of resistance. You could not, oh, dual nationals could not uh, hold so many positions, but now uh, you know, that has been passed by the Supreme Court. Um, I actually feel I, I have always felt that uh, overseas Pakistanis are our biggest asset. My hope for Pakistan is that by the time I'm an adult, uh, Imran Khan finishes all poverty. Being an overseas Pakistani, I strongly believe Imran Khan is the only one who could bring Pakistan out of this, um, you know, crisis. He's the only one who could save Pakistan. My main connection to Pakistan is through family. I would visit every year when I was younger, but I haven't been in a long time. I really miss the people and the atmosphere and the overall culture of the country. I look forward to going back very soon. I grew up in the West, but my parents always took me to Pakistan to visit family. I love the vibrant clothing, flavorful food, and welcoming people. There is such a warm and neighborly sense of community in Pakistan. Imran Khan is the best choice to lead Pakistan because he is the number one choice of the people of Pakistan and the dictates of democracy demand that he represents the people of Pakistan. The way he talks to people, the way he listens to people, um, which I have seen firsthand and it continues to shock me. The way he doesn't give up, uh, doesn't accept defeat. First he didn't win anything. He, nobody took him seriously. Eventually, he won one seat. Well, there's only one sentence that comes to mind, you know, describing him or his personality. It's uh, perseverance commands success. I have seen a huge spiritual awakening in Imran Bhai, which is now trickling down into the masses of Pakistan. This is a huge game changer for Pakistan. And I do feel that we should uh... And I, and I am, I mean, we are gradually making it easier and easier for them to uh, adjust in Pakistan. There, there was a lot of resistance and there had to be a resistance because the status quo, which is, which is uh, comfortable in a certain sy system, will always resist any change. But I think we are moving in that direction too. nations um, first before becoming great they are someone's dream they're always dreamers poets maybe but idealists who dream of big things and so therefore first there's this dream and then the nation uh, you know if it's lucky 
gets close to the dream. So for us, so let me just say that what I feel is, is for Muslims will always be the greatest dream is to emulate a prophet peace be upon him. And, and, and this, the society of Medina, you know, which is within, it is within the pale of history. It's not mythology. So here he was, he came and, and, and created the society. And then he, the state became a model for so many hundred years uh, when, the, when the Muslims became leaders of the world. But that was based on that, uh, and that very humane, just, civilized society which he created in Medina. And so throughout history, when Muslims have aspired to get to that ideal, they have risen. And when they move further away from the uh, ideal, they go down. And any, even non-Muslims, when they get close to that ideal of that Medina society, a just and humane society, they also rise up. And I always think that the Scandinavian countries uh, somehow are closest to that uh, ideal. Arab is not superior to a non-Arab. A non-Arab is not superior to an Arab. A white person is not superior to a black person. And a black person is not superior to a white person, except in piety and good works. Your reaction. Um, and, you know, he added that we are all children of Adam. The prophet added that all humanity uh, descends from Adam. So therefore, and hence he says that we're all, uh, there is no, uh, because of color, uh, we, are, uh, we are not superior or inferior, but because of our deeds. So which is uh, the whole emphasis on, um, on our sense to be human as opposed to intelligent animals. The Quran says, to you, your religion, to me, my religion. So that means that Islam recognizes there are other religions and they can pray, pray in their own way. We pray in our own way. So there should be no conflict. So we respect each other and we do not uh, try to undermine the, the beliefs of uh, different people of different religion. Honestly, Salman, if we could get the Abrahamic faiths and the theologians of the Abrahamic faiths together, working on peace, this would bring peace to much of the world. I, I, my visual that I want to get taking place is having these top theologians stand in front of the tomb of Abraham and all dressed in their official uh, religious uh, gear and say, that we, we all claim this guy. He, the, he's, the, he's the starter of this. And then, and then to ask ourselves, is, do, well, should we be killing each other then? If we're all from, if we're all claiming this heritage, this person? And how would you interpret that document of human rights to the world of today? Uh, world, not just of today, uh, throughout human history, this, uh, this conflict has been between those who, uh, who wanted to be humane uh, and just, and those who wanted to be, act like intelligent animals, might is right and survival of the fittest. So, you know, when a, a strong country attacks a weaker country for its resources, it's no different from a tribe of chimpanzees who attack another tribe, weaker tribe, and, and kill them and, and have their uh, uh, feeding grounds. So take over their feeding grounds. This is exactly what, what happens when uh, stronger countries throughout human history have sub, sub, subdued other human beings and taken away their resources and impoverished them. So this is a conflict throughout history. It's, it's not at any one particular time. And you always have uh, within countries this, this sort of conflict going on. Uh, you have this uh, similar uh, within countries, uh, and and you just have to look at the world. There are very few times you come up with a leadership which is very humane and just. Like for instance, Nelson Mandela. You know, here was a 
person who forgave his uh, oppressors and sort of uh, united humanity. And you always have leaders, genuine leaders always unite human beings. And non-leaders spread hatred and, uh, and uh, uh, divide humanity to stay in power. So it's, this is throughout history. I'll follow up on another part of the same khutbah, the last khutbah, where Prophet Wasallam said that you have rights over your women, but they also have rights over you. Feed them, clothe them, treat them well. They are your committed helpers. Please react to that. Uh, so what that means is that um, uh, throughout history, uh, unfortunately, weak always get deprived of their rights. So it, this is basically that um, uh, man and woman have complementary roles on this earth. Women have their strengths, men have their strength. And really, it's that complementary role that uh, enhances relationships. So um, that's how I look at it. I think that uh, some, sometimes uh, the e equality is uh, mistaken for sameness, as if men and women are the same, which is not true because we have different attributes. But we are equal, but we are different, and we have complementary uh, characteristics. I think that uh, a civilized society uh, allows its uh, women to achieve their potential. So it creates the condition, it facilitates them so that they become uh, uh, equal contributing human beings uh, to a society. So Prime Minister, there's a book by the scholar Gay Eaton, uh, Islam and the Destiny of Man. Uh, so in that book, he talks about predestination and free will, that they, they coexist and they intermingle with each other. Now, you've seen, you know, cricket, uh, philanthropist, social activist, politician, prime minister. Looking back, what would you say about predestination and free will? Look, my thesis, you know, I'm not a some Muslim scholar, I've, my evolution of Islam has been, you know, from my own experiences in life. So I never understood why this five time prayers in a day. I never understood this. But it's only that later on, during my own struggle, I began to realize that what do we ask in a prayer is, we are asking Allah to show us the right way not the way that, uh, you know, who have the path of their own destruction. Now, I did not realize at the moment, at that time, how important is that right way? Because you're constantly presented with choices. There is one choice where it is the way of uh, those he's blessed. And those were, of course, our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the messengers of God. On the other way is the path which is of our destruction. Now these two ways is really, it depends upon how high you will go in life. If you make that right choice. Now, why is it so important? Because we can only strive. Allah has only given us that ability to struggle. Whether we succeed in the struggle or not is not in our hands. That's why I began to understand why, why it says, show me the way of those you, who you blessed, not the destination. So all we are asking to be on that way. And it is that way which eventually takes us to the heights. So if you, if you study the life of the Holy Prophet, you will see that it was a very difficult life. Yet we are asking for that life. And why, are, you know, when we pray five times a day, we are actually asking for the life of the Prophet because he was someone who 
who in, in the Quran says that beloved Allah loved the Prophet. Rahmatullah Alameen. No, he, not Rahmatullah. Habibullah. Habib, uh, Habibullah. Uh, yeah. so, it, so if why are we asking for his way? Because he was the greatest human being ever. And therefore we, so that's the ideal we want to move towards. Prime Minister, the last question. You're a dreamer. I've known you since the age of 18. You dream big. Last time I spoke to you was 30 years ago on camera. 2050, the year is 2050. Can you just cast your heart and mind towards 2050? Where would you like to see Pakistan in 2050? 2050 is rather far away, but I, I, I look into the uh, 2020s. By the end of 20s, uh, 2030, I think Pakistan will become one of the most powerful countries in the world. Powerful countries doesn't mean if you have just have nuclear weapons and so on, but powerful countries because we have a young population, a vibrant young population. We, Pakistan is full of resources. Even I had no idea until I became the prime minister, the amount of uh, God-given blessings this country has. So we can, with a little bit of effort, Pakistan can actually increase its product, double its productivity, agricultural productivity. If we double, and it's easy because in China, their productivity, their yields are three times as much, four times as much as Pakistan. Even if we double ours, which with close relationship with China we can, the whole scenario will change and this can happen between two three years secondly we are sitting on massive reserves we are on rare earth minerals we have gemstones we have one of the most fertile lands we have one of the most varied uh, landscape this country can become a tourist haven already Condé Nast thought of Pakistan as the uh, as the next uh, tourist haven uh, uh, a place which has versatility, which has religious tourism, which has uh, one of the greatest trekking and mountain tourism. So this country has immense potential. It just needs direction, uh, which, we are, which we are in the right direction. It, we need to fix the administration, uh, administrative system because unfortunately, the, as I said, when crooks take power, they destroy the state institutions. And that's the biggest damage. It's not the money they take out. It's when you destroy state institutions, you weaken them. It takes a bit longer to build them. And I give you an example. We built the second Shokat Hanam in Peshawar, which is of international standard. In three years, we built a world-class institution. But for last six years, we've been trying to modernize the existing government hospitals in, in KP, the Lady Reading Hospital. It's much, much more difficult. So to, to fix a, a, a system which has bad practices in it, it is a much more difficult exercise. To build a completely new institution with new, in, a new frame of mind set up, it's much easier. So we are up against fixing a system which has, you know, which, is in a, which was in an advanced state of decay. 
Remember in 60s, Pakistan's institutions were of high, high quality. Our bureaucracy was considered one of the best bureaucracies in, the, in, in Asia. And all our development programs were managed by a bureaucracy, which was high quality. But gradually the politicization and then the, these two families really destroyed Pakistan's institutions. So really we are in a process of getting them right. We will. So we will get the, uh, the, the institutions right. But the potential this country has is so huge. Is, and you know, we have, a, as I said, a young, second youngest population. So all we have to do is to guide this younger population, mix the two, this potential of the country and a young population, fix the governance system, and this country will take off. Hello.